Um, so we'll start by doing the uh, the introduction for uh, uh, for our speaker today. Um, so uh, so we have Ben and Sergey presenting um, graph neural network for link prediction with subgraph sketching, which is a uh, uh, top five percent in the iClear twenty twenty three. Um, so uh, so a very interesting recent work today. Um, and uh, yeah, so in terms of their uh, their speaker bio. Um, Dr. Ben, ben Chabling is a uh, principal scientist at Charm Therapeutics, where he works on 3D machine learning to develop cancer drugs. He was previously a staff machine learning researcher within the GraphML group at Twitter and the head of machine learning at um, ASOS.com. He, uh, he did his PhD at Imperial College with Professor uh, Mark Denson Roth on large scale graph ML. And we also have um, Sergey here. Um, Dr. Sergey uh, Shirobokov, uh, and sorry for the pronunciation, um, if any, um, is a senior uh, machine learning scientist at ShareChat, where he works on improving the company's recommender algorithms. He was previously a, uh, a senior machine learning researcher at, um, at the Twitter Cortex team, uh, and he did his PhD at, uh, at Imperial College London on um, simulator-based optimization um, algorithms for high energy physics. Um, and uh, yeah, so I will hand uh, the mic to you too. Um, yeah. Thanks, Andy. Tremendous introduction. Um, thanks as well for inviting us, give us some practice before we have to do this at ICLR in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, stop the team. Yeah. I seem to have like something like 20 different options, so I don't know what's going to get shared here. Oh no, allow Zoom to share screen. I think you can just share a tab if you have it on the Google Slides. Hey, I'm going to have to quit and reopen Zoom. I literally installed Zoom for this meeting. Okay. So I'm going to bounce out and be back. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's wait a little bit uh, for uh, for the screen sharing. Um, Um, so yeah, so uh, so uh, so at the meantime, you can find the um, the abstract of the paper on the reading group website, um, and I think Ben is back, so I will readmit him. Um, can you hear me, Ben? I think you're muted. I was muted. I am now hopefully unmuted. Okay, perfect. You want to try try sharing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you yes, can everyone can. see that? Fantastic. Yes. It's very nice slide. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Tremendous. It's keynote default slide template four or something. Yeah. Available to all. Cool. Good to know. Good to know. Right. So hopefully all of you are aware that this is presentation of graph neural networks for link prediction with subgraph sketching, which was accepted at ICLR this year. I'm going to talk for the first half, maybe a bit more than half, and then Sergey is going to take over to describe the details of the model. Um, if you want to chat to Sergey and I, or find out more about this work or any of other work, then follow us on Twitter and DM us, um, and we'd be very happy to acquire a couple more followers. So the first thing I want to talk about really is. Um, uh, I'm sorry, one quick question. Do you prefer us to ask questions in the middle of the talk? Like if people have questions, we just ask them, or do you prefer at the end of the talk? Andy, that is an excellent question. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's much better if you interrupt us frequently. Otherwise, I might as well just put this on YouTube and you could just watch the video. So yeah, please, please, like, uh, let's make a discussion rather than a uh, presentation. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Ben. Cool. So all of these, however many people 
co-authored this paper with us, something like seven of them. We all were part of the Twitter graph machine learning group when we did the work. We did it over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Now, none of us are part of the Twitter machine learning group due to a well-publicized takeover by a well-known megalomaniac. Um, so we all been scattered across uh, different industries and different countries. But we did this work at Twitter, so I do want to talk a little bit about why um, why we did it and give you a bit of context. So you may be aware that just like every other large web service, pretty much everything you see on Twitter um, is a recommendation. So your home timeline is algorithmically generated, it's personalized, um, as are what you see what's happening, as is who to follow, um, as are many more services. We probably have something like 15 recommendation services uh, running on Twitter all the time, even the notifications are recommendations. So recommendations is, you know, is the platform upon which, which Twitter runs. And also just like every other large scale recommender system, we have too much stuff to recommend to be able to rank it all. So for us, we're, you know, we're recommending every single tweet. There may be 100 million tweets generated every single day. We just don't have the compute or the time um, or the latency to actually rank them all. So we use a multi-stage recommendation system. Um, and the way that works is you have, a, you have a candidate generation system, which will maybe generate uh, something like a million to 100,000 candidates. And then that will go into one or two ranking systems which are use a heavier type of machine learning, uh, which will then produce in the end, you know, a handful of ordered items. Maybe, you know, for a timeline, you might end up with 200 or something. Now, when we started at Twitter, we expected to find a state-of-the-art recommendation system, probably using some deep learning, probably using convnets on Twitter images or a large language model processing the text. That is not what we found. What we found was a system that was pretty much just a bag of uh, link prediction heuristics. So this is quite quite surprising, uh, a little bit disappointing, but it, we were we were kind of buoyed by the opportunity to bring our extensive deep learning knowledge to bear on the problem of Twitter. We were like, this is going to be easy. They, they, you know, they're five years, ten years behind the state of the art. We're going to make Twitter a hundred times better. Um, so these, these heuristics, generally, these link prediction heuristics, they exist in, there are sort of three types, really. There's a first order where you just look at someone's neighbors. There's second order or one and a half order where you look at the neighbor's neighbors, properties of the neighbor's neighbors. And then you have these uh, long scale heuristics. So things like page rank is a, would be a long scale, uh, large range heuristic. Um, and this is sort of more in, in detail schematic of how the system works. It was something called SIM clusters. Um, and what they, what they did was they created this bipartite graph where almost all users of Twitter were in one part. And then something like the top million to 100,000 users were deemed producers and they're in the other part. And then the producers were clustered and um, a user would be described as their affinity for these 100,000 producers and it was uh, made sparse. But it was a very, very, very well engineered, but from a machine learning perspective, very, very sort of hacky thing. And then at the end of it, you did a, the nearest neighbors and that's, that's what you got recommended. Or those are the candidates that you got um, recommended, which are then ranked downstream by another machine learning system. Um, so my team was largely acquired by Twitter um, in this Fabula acquisition. Um, so this is Michael Bronstein and some of Michael Bronstein's students um, and a couple of other people. And the reason this team was hired was actually to do fake news detection. Um, I mean, that's, it was called Fabula, the company, which I guess is a, like a sort of Latin word for a, a fable or a story. But it's, um, it was brought in to do fake news detection but their speciality or our speciality was very much graph neural networks. And so we were trying to apply graph neural networks really to Twitter. We were Twitter's big graph neural network bet. And so in we came with our extensive graph neural network skills ready to revolutionize Twitter. 
And we tried to replace this SIM clusters thing with graph neural networks. And it was a tremendous failure. Uh, they just they just didn't work. Like we couldn't we couldn't match the results of SIM clusters at all, despite our um, big egos. And we couldn't um, even if we could have matched the results or exceeded the results, we couldn't actually scale this stuff with Twitter's existing infrastructure. Um, so this is a bit of a problem. It was kind of quite upsetting for a group of graph neural network people, um, but it was the, the state of uh, things when we when we joined Twitter. And we scratched our heads for a while because we couldn't really understand like what what was going on, like why why when graph neural networks were performing so amazingly at so many different problems across so many different spaces, could they not do recommendations at Twitter? But we we genuinely didn't really know. So what are the problems with graph neural networks for link prediction? Well, the, I guess the first and most significant problem is they, they don't work. Um, out of the box, they do not work. So these are, these are the OGB data sets, the Open Graph Benchmark data sets, which are, um, certainly when we're writing a paper, these are the major benchmarks that people look at for link prediction. Um, and SAGE and GCN are the two probably most well-known graph neural networks still certainly the most well cited and Adam Chadar and common neighbors are incredibly simple one hop heuristics for link prediction. Now you'll see from this sort of not very sophisticated table that I've drawn that um, the graph neural networks only win in 50% of the OGB link prediction data sets, which is not very good considering these models have you know millions of parameters take days to train or you know, maybe not days but hours to train um, and uh, you know, hard to engineer compared to a heuristic, which is you know, utterly trivial. So that's a bit of a problem. Uh, we still don't really understand why, um, but um, as graph neural network research progressed, we started to, as a community, realize a lot of the limitations of graph neural networks. So these, these simple heuristics, they're, all they're doing really is counting triangles. So if um, if you have a if you want to measure the probability of an edge between nodes i and j in this diagram, all common neighbors is doing is is just adding the number of triangles that involve i and j. So in this case, it's three triangles. Um, Adam Mitchell is just the number of you, you add up the triangles that you weight each triangle by one over the log degree of the um, of the neighbor. Uh, which kind of makes sense, I guess, because you know, if you have lots of friends, then you don't really have any friends. Um, and resource allocation is exactly the same as Adam Mitchell does without the log. But they're all, they're all just sort of, they're, at their heart, they're all just counting triangles. Now, graph neural networks, we kind of know, um, can't actually count triangles. So I don't know if you guys, do you guys do graph neural networks? You, this is a, I'm not actually sure what you guys specialize in. Uh, yes. So, well, like on my end, I do. And we, uh, so, so this is a temporal graph reading group. So I guess we are more focused on temporal graph GNN. And uh, so me and Pharma uh, actually have some papers on, uh, from last year's NeurIPS talking about the limitation of link prediction for temporal graph. So uh, one thing I also discussed with Emma before is, is like, it's just nowhere close to getting temporal graph GNNs for large scale recommender systems so far. Um, but hopefully that's something we can see like, you know, uh, like a few years from now, uh, potentially. So utilize the temporal information as well. Yeah, yeah. That, that would be super cool. Yeah. So, you know, we, work, we worked on temporal graphs a bit um, with this um, TGM paper, like um, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay. So you will know then that most the standard message passing neural network is by spider lemon equivalent. So it, it can't count triangles because it literally cannot distinguish between these two graphs on this slide. And one of them has no triangles and one of them has two triangles. So it's fundamentally impossible for a graph neural network to count triangles. And therefore, fundamentally impossible for a standard graph neural network to approximate even these very, very basic heuristics which are, were fundamentally how the recommendation system at Twitter works and also beat graph neural networks on 50% of the OGB benchmark. So this is a pretty massive problem. And then this other, this other issue, which 
like all the best problems is it seems incredibly obvious um once someone points it out but again we didn't realize until um uh i get this name so wrong Svinivasan and ribero published this uh, what is actually a really really excellent paper in 2019 um if any of you have read it or not i think it's going to be um, very significant for a long time uh where they point out this is this massive issue really which is that if you have um uh, permutation equivariant graph neural network, which you, you know you want it to be permutation equivariant because otherwise you relevel the nodes and you get different results. Then it has to assign uh, the same representation to any two nodes in the same orbit induced by the graph automorphism group, uh, which is a really uh, mathsy way of saying like any two nodes that are fundamentally indistinguishable have to get the same representation, which you which you want, right? It's something you definitely want, but it's something you actually really don't want for link prediction. So in this case, two and four are in the same orbit. And so they get exactly the same representation. Um, and what that means is that the graph neural network is fundamentally blind to distances. So uh, the, a link um, between say uh, one and two has exactly the same probabilities as link between one and four because the graph neural network cannot distinguish between two and four, they have the same representation. And no matter how big the graph is, you get this problem all over the place. So yeah, this link and this link have to be assigned equal probability. Now that, again, that is a that is an enormous problem. Does that does that make sense? Yes, yes. Uh, do you think so? Just more on the discussion side. Uh, do you think the problem is because GNN are very node focused? So we know that GNN sometimes work really well for node level tasks like node classification, and then when you go to the link level, you have to merge node embeddings to get. Uh, link level task, right? So then maybe it's not really optimized for uh, link level tasks. So what some of the recent trend we see in temporal graph is that people are moving away from GNN models or try to directly come up with like edge level embeddings. So instead of predicting from two node embeddings, you generate some random walk or some sort of edge feature directly from the history, and then you predict from that. Um, so, and it seems to have good performance and link prediction, at least for temporal graph side. So, but I don't know yeah. if, like, what's your take on that? No, you're, you're absolutely right. So, a GNN, a, a permutation equivariant node classifier cannot work for link prediction. It just can't, it's impossible. I mean, so the, the, the caveat is that normally you have features on the nodes. And so, what people normally say is, like, okay, well, this is all very good if you have no features and you have simple graphs, but actually, when you have complex networks and features, you don't have any graphs that are in the same automorphism, any nodes in the same automorphism group. So this problem sort of goes away, but in practice it doesn't. And we don't really know why. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, they're not, they're not um, in, the, in the naive form, graph neural networks are not appropriate for link prediction, which is why they didn't work. Um, no. Yeah, thanks, it makes sense. Yeah, so on that note, like I think also in the paper, where we discuss like the uh, the, uh, the, kind of distinguish between automorphic nodes and node pairs. And then we also like uh, show that uh, this uh, would be very different for uh, GNNs and, GNN and for especially for message passing, how, how they would distinguish between these two or not distinguish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Bam. So, in order to fix graph neural networks for link prediction, well, the, the first thing that was done um, quite successfully actually was to label all of the nodes. Um, and this, this labeling scheme, uh, this particular one is called distance labeling, I think. I think that's what it's called. Um, so you have a target edge here, that sort of thick dark line on my slide. And then you label every node um, with its distance to the first um, node in the edge and to the second node in the edge. Um, and now, once you do this, you, you can easily count triangles because any node labeled 1-1 one, one is a neighbor of both of the target nodes and so is part of your triangles. You, ha you have you know, automatically given yourself triangle counting here. Um, and you don't have the automorphic node problem anymore because um, every edge has different node features. So for every target edge, your node features change. So this is a massive, massive problem as well, because you can't, you have to completely change your data set every time you want to train on a different edge. 
Do you know how many like it's it's kind of um, yeah it's it's pretty awful. Um, so you don't basically have any any scalability, any parallelization anymore. You have to like completely do this labeling scheme for every every single positive edge and every single negative edge. Um, so here these are these are the same graph but the different target graphs. You can see that the labeling scheme has to completely change. Um, so it, in order, the guys that came up with this, or at least one of the first groups to come up with this, uh, Mihan Zhang and others, um, they solved this problem uh, using subgraph neural networks. So instead of labeling the whole graph, relabeling the whole graph for every edge, they just extracted a subgraph around the target edge. And they had some kind of, um, I might have a slide about this actually. Um, I, I do, yeah, okay. Yeah. So they had their, their rationale, whether it was backported or not, I, I suspect that they had this idea, realized it was impossible to scale, and then kind of backported some theory to support it. But that's not obviously how the paper is presented. The paper um, has some analysis of various heuristics, and it shows that the error decays exponentially with the number of hops you go from the, the two target nodes, which you know, which it kind of does for page rank and things like that. And, and obviously, if you're doing nearest neighbors, you have no error because you have the whole graph. You have the whole neighbor graph. And so they said seal is sort of this bag of heuristics. We only need the subgraphs, um, and it did work spectacularly well. It does work spectacularly well. So it, you know, it solved it solved those two big problems. Seal is the way to get graph neural networks to work um, for link prediction, with the absolutely enormous caveat that um, actually I probably have like a weaknesses slide somewhere. Maybe I do. Okay, so this is it. That's coming. So this is how seal works. So you have your target your target nodes and um, your edge I don't care about. Have I frozen? I froze for a bit, I didn't know. And then you do a sort of one hop expansion around both of those guys. And then normally, it's pretty much always two hops. You do a two hop expansion. So you have this, this subgraph, and this is all you care about now when predicting that edge. Um, and uh, yeah, so then you knock out all of the edges from one of those nodes and just calculate the distance. Um, every other node in the subgraph from the red guy and then um you do the opposites so you knock out all the red guy's edges and calculate the distances from the yellow guy and then that is your that is your labeling scheme and then, like i said you just completely ignore the fact that there's a, a massive graph surrounding this thing that then goes into uh, a graph neural network so you do message passing on the subgraph you embed these labels and you do some kind of pooling on the end and that gives you a, a, a probability of this edge between the red and yellow node existing. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, good, it's a good model. Um, it works very well. It just um, like, uh, has these many, many issues. So you have to generate the subgraphs. So you end up either doing that on the fly, which is super slow because you have to do a uh, two hop depth first search for every single edge, or you, do it on, you put them on disk and you end up with something that's maybe a hundred times larger than the input graph and also then like the second you want to change any of the parameters you kind of have to regenerate it so it's super annoying to work with uh, the labels also have to be regenerated for every edge um, so um, you can kind of do that while you're extracting the graph but not quite so it's like order makes it actually order e for power law graphs um, which is what we had at twitter right if you, if you get unlucky at twitter and you do you hit justin bieber on like the first hop then you have something like yeah, 150 million nodes in one subgraph so then you actually have to filter out you only end up looking at so many neighbors anyway so it's also approximate in that sense um what else oh yeah so these things are irregular so they don't fit on gpu um very well um you can't really do more than two hops so if you have any dis distant effects you can't really capture them because you get to three hops or four hops then basically looking at the whole graph and you have exactly the same scaling probably um problems um yeah so so we couldn't actually use seal at twitter even though when we benchmarked it it did do really really well um we just couldn't scale it even to like the smallest graphs we have um but we did analyze it very carefully to see if we could strip away any of the any of the complexity really we wanted to sort of do seal without the subgraphs if possible uh, so there are there are four components of seal that are really expensive um you have to you have to label the subgraphs 
uh, you have to embed the labels. They do a sort of one-hot embedding scheme uh, for, the, for their uh, distance labels. You then propagate the uh, embeddings of these distance labels and the features on a GNN. And then there's some sort of uh, subgraph level readout function after that. Um, so we looked at the, um, the labeling um, and it is, it is kind of critical to getting the um, seal to work. So it's the thing that allows you to count triangles. It's the thing that solves the automorphic node problem. Uh, but actually, like it's really dominated by the low distances. This graph at the bottom here shows that the, the obviously the triangle counts is the most important thing, but then the, the two one neighbors. So the, uh, that means a node that's two hops from one and one hop from another. The count of those things is important. It decreases exponentially with high distance. They they embed the the labels and the labels are distances, so it's quite weird to embed them. The labels are it's a two dimensional distance from you know one node and another node but they just embed it because i guess that's what you do with deep learning if you don't know what you're doing um if you don't know what to do they don't they very much do know what they're doing but they you know it's the, i guess it's the standard thing to do is embed everything so they embedded them we found out that this actually hurts performance um and then the gnn propagation where they take these embeddings attach them to features and propagate them around the graph neural network um is actually completely unnecessary it gets you nothing um so that's a sort of smoothing of this feature around the network. Now, when you think about it, message, message passing only really makes sense for graph neural networks because it smooths information on, on homophilus graphs. Uh, now, why, why in God's name would you want to smooth distance information when you have perfect information to start with? Why would you then want to smooth that over a graph neural network? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and unsurprisingly, it doesn't, didn't help at all. And then they had this readout function where they took the whole graph and had some quite complex readout function from every node in the subgraph. And what we found is that actually you just need to take the two target nodes, so the, the, the nodes that make up the edge that you want to predict for, and just use the features on those guys. So what this all, all meant was that there was a possibility to do something in the spirit of SEAL, but actually not use the subgraph. So a lot of the things that they did were not really key. What was key is that they could count triangles and solve the automorphic node problem. So the, the main idea um, behind our work really is to augment the nodes with features that can solve these two problems, triangle counting, automorphic nodes, um, but that are not conditioned on the edges. Because the second you condition everything on the edge, you have this hopeless scalability issues. Um, so a quick question on uh, what you discussed. So from the, the full points that you were talking about, can we conclude that link prediction is an extremely local task? That means that you actually, in general, don't care about most of the large graphs that you have. But as long as you do like a K-hop, let's say two-hop, and you will be fine most of the cases. And even the, like the, the, the GNN smoothing stuff is not even required because you know, it's not like it's extremely local. That means just the two nodes of interest plus some feature on them is like good enough. No, no I don't think you can conclude that as a global statement. That's certainly true of these relatively simple homophilus graphs. We have no mathematical proof of that fact. Or I think for there are probably many more interesting graphs where it's not a local phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But for these graphs, it is. And, and for the oh, OGB okay. graphs, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, have, we have one, I think one of the OGB graphs requires um, three hops to work well. I can't remember which one it is now. Um, so, yeah, so you don't remember the, one of them, one of them needs to be three hops. Um, um, but like in general, it's like a few hops is good in general to try. Uh, well, yeah, so what, I mean, if you have a power law, um or small world graph right there the whole thing is five hops right right exactly okay thanks uh, okay so right so subgraph sketching so this is this was our our solution um to being able to put everything on the nodes um in such a way that you can extract or actually approximate these edge features uh, without having to relabel for every edge do you, are you guys familiar with 
data sketching i know like people do it in their undergraduates but then they normally like don't think about it for the rest of their lives not familiar familiar a bit um, this is going to determine how much time i spend on the next two slides or not interested and i can just skip through it i would say going through the background would be good uh, like we have a different background here i guess yeah okay so we used in this work, we used two different types of sketching technique. We used something called min hashing and something called hyperloglog. -log. Both of these techniques, they they are methods to represent sets. So you can think of them almost as then it's not quite the same, but you can think of it as learning an embedding of a set. Just like you do maybe with a, a neural network. But these embeddings are quite limited in the sense that given two embeddings of two different sets, you can only extract one piece of information from these embeddings. And that, in the case of Minhash, is the estimated Jacquard similarity of those two sets. So Jacquard um, is the intersection of the sets divided by the union, the number of elements in the intersection divided by the union. And hyperloglog -log similarly allows you only to estimate the size of the union of those two sets. Um, so the, because the min hash gives you the jacquard, which is intersection divided by union, and hyperloglog -log gives you the union, then you can multiply them together and get the intersection of two sets. So that's what we were doing here. We're really estimating the, the size of the intersections of sets. Uh, and the sets that we cared about were the neighborhoods of different nodes. So now we have a way of uh, estimating, say, the, the shared neighbors of any two nodes or the shared two hop neighbors of any two nodes without having to relabel the entire graph for every edge. This information is the same for every node and just sits on the nodes, irrespective of which edge you're predicting for. So that's that's like the high level why it works. That That's quite good. That, does that make sense? Maybe, um, maybe not. Yes, yes that makes sense. So okay. it's like pre-computed embedding for the nodes that you just retrieve at that test time. Yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. It's like a pre-computed embedding that sits on every node, which allows you to extract edge features in like super fast at test time. But actually, we sort of do it at train time as well. But I'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the spirit of it. Yeah, it's features that live on the nodes that let you calculate these edge features really quickly instead of having to relabel the graph and generate a subgraph and all other stuff. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and there's a question from the audience from Rosanna is, uh, do you want to ask the question yourself, Rosanna, or uh, or I can relay the question? Uh, it's fine. You can ask it. Uh, OK. Uh, so, so, uh, so when links are added to the graph, does the embedding change? Well, so the embedding is a representation of the neighborhood of a node. And so if the neighborhood changes, then the uh, embedding would change. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so min hashing, um, the idea is to generate for every node you want to generate this uh, they call it a signature but you can think of it as an embedding and uh, someone's trying to get in someone called ritwick uh, andy uh yes i just let them in and so you take uh take the universe of objects that you're interested in so in our case the universe is every single node in your graph and then you have a load of sets and the sets are let's say the one hop neighbors of every node and you to generate a hash you randomly assign uh, a value from one to the total number of nodes to every node and then for each of your sets the min hash is the minimum value that gets assigned and so that's your first kind of character in this min hash signature and then you permute all of the node levels and then do the same trick you do the min again um, and you keep doing that uh, for however long your embedding is, say 128 dimensions, um, which, seems, which sounds like a quite crazy thing to do. Um, 
but with a little bit of simple maths, you can see that if you do that, then if you, by taking the, um, I can't remember, what's the similarity called where you just check every, if every element's equal or not? Is that the Hadamard similarity? So maybe it's a Hadamard similarity. No, it's ha ha Hamming similarity. Hamming, Hamming similarity. similarity thanks, yeah. David. Yeah. So then once you once you do this trick, if you take the hang the Hamming similarity between any two of those signatures, you get the Jacquard similarity back. Um, it was invented, I think, by some guys at Google, um, whose name his name escapes me. But I once sat behind him in a conference and he spent two hours looking at recipes during the talks, which I can't remember his name. Um, Okay, and, and this this uh, this minhash thing has um, like a really amazing property as well, which is if you have two signatures and you want to merge them. So let's say um, you have you know the minhash of your one hop neighbors, but you want to get your minhash of your two hop neighbors. You can merge them just by taking the element wise min of the signatures. So to go from one hop to two hop, you you take the signatures of all of your neighbors and just take the element wise min of all of them. And then you have your two hop signature. So this is this is a super incredibly useful property from the perspective of a graph neural network person because that is a permutation invariant operation, which you can pass down edges, which makes a new thing from your neighbor's thing. Um, and hyperlog log is sort of similar. So you um, for every element in your set, you hash it. Um, and then you kind of estimate the size of the set. Um, you hash it to a binary number and you estimate the size of the set based on the number of zeros. Um, and that's simply because the, like, the probability of getting, in this case, three uh, zeros in a row is an eight. So your set is probably, if you have that, that's the most leading zeros, then your set is probably size eight. And if you have, if you see four, then your set is probably about size 16 and so on. Obviously that's pretty approximate. So you use the same trick that you use to the min hash, do it loads and loads of different times, um, and then you average it. And there, there are some other tricks involved around how you average, but that's the sort of spirit of it is that you, you, you hash all these numbers and you look at the largest number of leading zeros, and that gives you the size of a set. And so if you want to get the size of two sets, you take all of those um, numbers, which remember is just the number of leading zeros, and you take the maximum element-wise so again, you can do the, you can do the same trick. If you have the hyperlog log of your neighbors, you can get the hyperlog log of your two hop neighbors just by taking all of their hyperlog logs and, and doing element wise max. Okay. So is this the bit that you take over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can take it from there. So um, uh, I guess you can continue sharing the slides, right? If you have the, the yeah, yeah, just shout when you need a new page. Yeah. That's the next one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so basically the idea is that we want to utilize all these um, hashing tricks, right? And hyperlog log and mini hash. And on the, on the other hand, we want to, using them, we want to estimate this uh, feature, structural features in a similar fashion that was done uh, for a seal, right? Uh, and um, let's say then after that, we want to use this information. So the estimation of number of different structural features in the intersection of the two nodes neighborhood and use that as a feature, right? Because that will enable us to predict the probability of a link. Uh, so on the right, you can see this example of a graph uh, with nodes U and V. And uh, on the left is the kind of the uh, sketch of how we want to approximate the uh, features. So again, if you expand the two hop subgraph around each of the uh, nodes U and V, um, and then you can kind of, um, in a similar fashion as a seal, um, label the nodes um, with different labels, right? Uh, but uh, after that, after you label them, you want to obtain the estimation of the neighborhood intersection. So here we would denote it as A or B, and that will correspond to um, different, the, the nodes in the, uh, the number of nodes in the intersection of uh, these two neighborhoods. So for example, A11 would be the common neighbors. And A12 would be the neighbors that lies uh, one hop away from node B and two hops away from node U. And uh, if we have an estimation um, of the uh, D uh, hop neighborhood, so up to D hop neighborhood, we can construct these features A and B 
um, from these estimations. So uh, the next one. So again, remember that um, we have uh, two hashing uh, tricks. So win min hash and hyperlog log that, that would estimate either Jacquard similarity, which is intersection of a union or the cardinality of union of assets. And so for us to con construct our features A and B, we basically need to estimate the uh, intersection of uh, different neighbors of nodes U and V um, on different number of hops. And you can rewrite it as a, a product of a Jacquard similarity by the cardinality of a set. And by what Ben just told you uh, on a few slides before, uh, each of these terms, so Jacquard similarity and uh, the cardinality of uh, union, you can estimate using these uh, uh, hashes. And moreover, you can estimate this um, on each of the um, hope uh, for your graph neural network, right? So uh, you can start with initializing your um, hashes, H and M, uh, and then you can iteratively, in the same way as you would do in a message passing algorithm, uh, update the um, hashes uh, on different hops and then all the way constructed up to the hop D. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so just as I said before, all you would need to do is just uh, perform on each step of your JNN, uh, you would just perform the either mean max iteration, depending on the, if you use mean hash or hyperlog log, uh, and uh, collect all the uh, hashes from your neighbors and perform the aggregate iteration. And then you, are, you will obtain the representation of your hash for your node U uh, at the level L. Uh, uh, sorry, small, yeah. small question. Can I ask you? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sure, yes. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, yes, this, this discussion is about a specific node pair, right? Uh, like, no, no, so, um, so, 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 so here is a trick. So, here, uh, because we are obtaining the hashes for nodes themselves, themselves yet yeah, so far, we don't need at that, at that step when we do the uh, this uh, passing and aggregation, you don't need to uh, have any representation of the node pairs, it's just for one single pair. So you take this, for example, node U, right? And then you take all its neighbors and uh, update the hashes. But when, when you would actually need the node pairs is once you would like to construct these features A and B that I have, been discuss I have discussed in the beginning. So at that point, you already have hashes, so you computed them. And then uh, once you want to work with, on the level of link prediction, so on the level of pairs, you would use these constructed hashes to compute the features for a pair. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it makes sense. But at the end, when you do this process, um, yeah. How do you pick the, the pair for which you're going to do it? Or if you're going to do it for the whole graph? Or uh, how do you choose the, the no, end pair? Oh. Yeah. So the end pair, that would, be, that would be something that in your training data set. So you, for, you want to predict the probability of a link. And some, you know, like some edges are uh, like, so in, in link prediction problem, uh, usually the, the data set is constructed in a bit peculiar, peculiar way. So you have a training. So for link prediction, you split the edges on, in two types. I don't know if you may be familiar with that. So there's like a supervision edges and message passing, right? And then uh, on validation time, you would have your uh, edges would be different. So on training time, your message passing edges are the same as your, uh, as your um, supervision edges. Validation time, you still keep the same edges for message passing, but you actually use different set of edges for uh, supervision. So this edge is kind of, the way you split the links or the edges is, de is, is uh, decide, defined by the data set. So that's how you, you would choose the, the, the links for which you want to uh, mm. compute this uh, yeah. uh, feature set. I, I was wondering in a, in a real world uh, uh, setting, in a real world application, like for Twitter, for example, how would you choose mm -hmm. at the end which nodes to check on this? I don't know if. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, I think it, it, for a real, real world application, you would have like you would pick one node because that node would uh, correspond to your uh, a person that you want to suggest something, for example, tweets. And then another 
set of nodes would be uh, some uh, tweet IDs or tweets in general, right? In the graph. So it was like a bipartite graph, users and uh, tweets. And what you would want to do, you would want to select this set of nodes, maybe already somehow pre-scored all of them. And then you would want to compute the probability of a link between this particular user and this set of nodes, uh, the tweet nodes. And then your probability of a link would be your rank in your ranking system. So I think it's a bit more tricky question. If you have a lot of uh, tweets, right? Do you want to score all of them for that particular user or you want to somehow to pre-score them? And then there, uh, the answer would be like, it depends uh, on which, on which stage of your ranking you would be using the algorithm because it's been mentioned in the beginning in like big recommender systems ranking is two stage you have like a candidate generation step where you have many candidates and there maybe it will be more challenging to use the approach but then the, after that there is like a ranker step in which you have like order of thousand hundred candidates and that of course would be quite easy to score with, with the gen Okay, um, so yeah, uh, so we can, we can update the uh, hashes. Uh, so was, was there using... another question there, Sergei? Oh, yeah, yeah I think another question. question from Rosanna. Okay. Okay. Hey, thanks. Uh, so just a quick question. So you're using something like a GNN-like propagation to actually construct these like hashes, like these features, and then yes, each node yes. will have both the mean something and the h something hash but then yes, the exactly so will next you yeah like those a and b features those would actually end up being the node features that are used for link prediction so something like this yes so that's the next slide okay that's and next slide that's a good question yes then, so maybe you are uh, sorry yes go ahead go ahead yeah but then does this gnn have any weights because it looks like it's yeah, yeah. So yes. Yeah, so in that sense, it will have weights on your uh, usual features, and okay. it will have weights when, when you'll be applying a dense layer on top of your features. But it won't have this like GCN part that you would say usually would be like in graph convolutional network. Oh, okay. Okay. So yes. these features that we propagate. So let's discuss this here. So um basically what we do uh, with the algorithm so we have this graph right and then now we know that each node is associated with the node features and then our hashes uh, the mean hash and uh, hyperlog log hash and then we just discussed that we can perform the update of uh, the uh, mean hash hyper log hash in a similar message passing procedure so for uh, node one for example we'll collect the all this uh, node features and hashes from node two and perform the update and in a similar manner, we would do the same for a node too. And like, you know, in a classical uh, message passing formalism. But you write that uh, our um, messages that it will be propagating. So for our hashing vectors, uh, they won't, they would not have any weights on top of them, right? So all we'll be doing, we'll be just iteratively taking element with min or element with max, right? To update the uh, vectors that correspond to hashes on different nodes. And then afterwards, uh, we would combine this with the feature nodes. And on top of them, we would perform some kind of uh, aggregation function. So again, it will be, uh, sorry. And then uh, we'll propagate features as well. Uh, for example, as, as I mean, as, as usual. And then on top of them would uh, imply some uh, MLP, for example, uh, to predict the final probability. Or the final representation of a, of a, of a, of a uh, node. So that, that's correct that there will be no weights uh, in the calculation of hashes involved. Um, right. So yeah, as we discussed, once we um, have done this, basically, as it was correctly mentioned, it's become like a message passing formalism, and we can implement this uh, propagation of uh, our hashes in message passing, and then. That's how we come up with this algorithm that we call ELF, efficient link prediction with hashes. But um, if you uh, just simply do this algorithm and still use message passing, you still have the problem uh, that it will not scale uh, very well. 
So maybe next slide, Ben. Ah, sorry, yes, yeah, uh, it's about that once we have our hashes in place, then that means that we can estimate our uh, features A and B, as we discussed uh, on a few slides ago. And then now uh, that means that these features would help us to either uh, count triangles or distinguish different automorphic nodes. So for example, here, or as I mentioned before, our feature A11 would correspond to number of common neighbors. That would mean that we can count uh, triangles. Or the next slide. Yeah, so or here, for example, in, as an exa Ben's previous example, when we cannot distinguish between the link one and two and one four. So maybe you can click through because it's an animation and it'll show you two links. Yeah, so now, <clears throat> uh, because if we look at this one hop neighborhoods around uh, nodes U, uh, around nodes two, four, and one, you see that there'll be an intersection between the nodes one and two and the no intersection between nodes one and four. So that means that again, our uh, feature A11, it'll be different. And then again, it'll en enables us to distinguish the uh, different links um, in the definition and then pre predict better predict the correct probability if there is a link or not between the edges. Uh, next slide. But yes, so uh, this was the first iteration of the algorithm. Uh, and then um, in reality, as we discussed before, GNNs are uh, efficient when we uh, can feed them fully in the GPU memory, or otherwise you must have to have to sample subgraphs, right? And then um, it becomes very, very inefficient. So um, you might have noticed that because we don't apply any weights during the propagation, uh, we can actually pre-compute all the uh, hashes that we just discussed um, upfront without any uh, GNN on top. And we can actually do a similar thing with the uh, node features. So we can just diffuse them uh, using, uh, so maybe next slide. Um, diffuse them on different uh, number of hops and co co concatenate these uh, diffused features in one single vector. And now uh, everything that we would need to do on top of that. Uh, so, I mean, again, we can pre-compute both of uh, our node features and uh, hashes and save them. Um, and then that means that now when we need to do training or testing, it'll be very, very fast to do because uh, now everything that we need to do is to apply the simple MLP on top of the each type of the features that we have obtained. And um, that would be our, uh, this MLP in the end would be the uh, neural network to predict the probability of a link between two uh, nodes. And in that formalism, we don't need any uh, subgraphs at all. Uh, next slide. So if you compare uh, the time complexity of our method with, for example, some subgraph method like seal, <laughs> so of course we would need some time to pro process the uh, features and it'll be order of number of hops by number of edges in the graph. Uh, whereas for seal, if it's like a dynamic one, uh, you won't need a pre processing. But on the other hand, during inference, uh, our method would be much, much faster uh, just because again, we wouldn't need to uh, construct any, any type of subgraphs around the, um, the link. And in that, sen in that sense, our method would be during inference independent on the size of the graph for, a, for a, uh, two pair of nodes. Next slide. Yes, so results. Um, so we compare our method with the planetoid data set and on planetoid data set and on OGB data set with different selection of methods and um, heuristics. And you can see, so our method to the, so at the top table, um, our methods, uh, elf and body are uh, bottom two rows. And in five out of uh, seven data sets, they achieve better results than the competitors. And the interesting uh, note here is that uh, our uh, more approximate version of our GNN, uh, so body that pre-computes everything, uh, sometimes outperforms um, the ELF algorithm. So it's, there is no clear uh, cut on whether um, any of this is better than, uh, one of this is better than the other in terms of performance and the metrics. And finally, um, at the bottom, you, see, you can see the runtimes of our algorithms in comparison to SEAL again and the classical GCN. And the you can see that the uh, body um, outperforms other methods by or orders of magnitude, both on like uh, small data sets and on large data sets. 
Uh, yes, I think uh, next slide. I think that's that's it. That's it about the result. Yes. So now, uh, yeah, maybe more questions to me and Ben. Perfect. One minute remaining of the hour. So yeah, that was that was so slick. We know it. So okay, so okay, sent me these slides twenty minutes ago. <laughs> Amazing. It lasted exactly fifteen minutes. Um. So, uh, yeah. So thanks so much for the presentation. And we have one minute. So I will ask. Uh, one question, I guess, uh, uh, like, and also like, feel free to send any questions. Uh, we can like, like, I, um, I can also like relay any question from the audience um, to you by email and so on, uh, if somebody send a question. Uh, but one thing I guess to ask for this reading group is how do you see this being extended to incorporate temporal graph information? So if you have edges that are coming in all the time and new nodes being, uh, being coming in, so how would you apply to that? Um, Right, so I mean, this was sort of the situation we had really at Twitter. Um, the thing is, so how how do you, if you just have new edges, then these approximations are quite are quite stable, because um, they're really telling you things like mo most nodes don't even have any common neighbors, for instance. So at, at Twitter, they're they're quite stable approximations. There are ways of updating hashes. So the 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 types of um, hashes we described there, the min hash and the hyperloglog. -log, are your real vanilla um, data sketching techniques? So the the most basic you can have. So uh, there there are many. The, you know, this is an entire subfield of um, I don't you know if you even call it machine learning, but certainly computer science. And there are there are many ways that these things can be updated and then be applied to weighted graphs um, and be applied to things that aren't sets and and all, all sorts of stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of work in that space. So we could we can adapt them. We just haven't. Uh, and now um, obviously we're working on different things. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what I would say there. Um, yeah, well, anything, anything your dad's saying? Mm, no, I think it's, uh, I, I would say with the temporal graphs, uh, don't you think that the estimation of hashes would become tricky? Like if you add nodes that maybe, uh, would, would not be that hard to estimate but then if i guess like in your application the edges disappear with time right so you have edges coming in and coming out all the time at different timestamps so it seems to me it'll be harder to kind of uh, estimate the missing edges no like once once they disappear between two nodes with these techniques yeah it's not obvious to me immediately how you do that yeah Thank you very much for the answer. There's also one other question from the audience. Uh, the question is, is there any mathematical proof of stability of the hashes? Uh, yeah, so there is. Um, uh, well, do we have this in the paper? Maybe it's in the appendix. Um, certainly there's a proof Not of Not about the hashes, I think. Of the estimation bounds. So it's like a... This is just a like a binomial estimation, isn't it? Um, so in terms of like how good they are at estimating the actual um, jacquard and the actual um, union size, I think it's like a the variance scales is one over the square root of the number of um, uh, the size of the um embedding or the size of the signature is that what you meant or did you mean stability when you add new edges um, um yes um, by stability i mean um regarding the temporal evolution of the graph uh as for example the twitter network is evolving all the time uh, can we prove it mathematically that uh, the hash structure uh, will remain more stable than the graph structure itself Good question. So the, ha the hash structure is a representation of the neighborhoods. Um, so I suppose if you if you have a very you know if you have a very small or very sparse graph and then you change the neighborhood a lot, then yes, then that I mean the hash will become unstable. I think that's that's pretty clear. If you kind of have a representation of a two-hop neighborhood, then you 
yeah, so I mean, it's something we didn't think about. Uh, and do you think it is uh, worth uh, doing research on? Uh, is it a good research direction for um, the next step of the study of um, this uh, direction for uh, temporal graphs? Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, there's a lot more we wanted to do here um, that unfortunately, due to the sort of dissolution of our group, we probably won't won't do. So there are two, I think, really interesting follow-up areas here. The the first one is we we've kind of designed a new type of graph neural network, but we didn't really push it very far at all. So it has this this idea of like passing sketching information, which is kind of giving a node of knowledge of its local environment, of which there are, like I said, many, many types. Of, um, has not been explored at all. Like this is literally the first paper to even even try to do this. Um, and we're not we're not like in a normal world, we would have probably publish five papers after this one, eating up all of these ideas. But now we're not going to do that. Um, so there's the, there's certainly that. And then the other thing which I would love to have worked on, which again, no, I probably won't have the chance to, is trying to generalize this this problem, this automorphic no problem, to the case where you actually have features or where you have um, a graph that doesn't really have any automorphic nodes, but yet we still observe these sort of problems. Now, there's, there's something going on there. I haven't, I have some ideas, but um, I don't think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's, it's a major, major piece of work. And I think like many people have observed this problem as well, and no one has yet solved it. Okay, thank you. Um. Yeah, so so thanks so much for the discussion and sorry for uh, for the internet. Uh, so I had some connection issue before, but let's uh, since we're at the end of hour here, let's uh, like wrap up the meeting for today, and then we can continue any discussion like offline. And also, there's a temporal graph like learning Slack. So if you're interested, like Sergey and Ben, you can join there, and then you can chat with like like people from the reading group there as well. Um, Great. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for listening to us the last hour. Um, nice no to meet you all. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.